Our panelists include General Frank Gorenz, Commander, U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Commander, U.S. Forces Africa, and Commander, Allied Air Command. That's a lot of titles, Frank. General Lori Robinson, Commander, Pacific Air Forces, Air Component Commander, U.S. Pacific Command, and Ms. Heidi Grant, Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force for International Affairs. Each will make a short presentation and then we'll open up for questions. I direct you toward your cards on your chairs. Uh, please fill your questions out and move them to the aisle and they'll get up here. Over to you. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate this uh, opportunity. On behalf of uh, General Gorenz and General Robinson and I, it's a real honor for the three of us to be up here. It's the first time we've done this panel to be, have a regional focus uh, of what we're doing out there with austere budgets. And thanks to all, all of you uh, for your interest in coming to the last session of the evening. It really means a lot to us to have this huge turnout. So thanks for being here. So let me go, go ahead and uh, get started. Um, you know, the one thing, if you can walk away, what you need to know is that the global challenges that we face today require even stronger global partnerships. If any of you sat in to hear General Robinson yesterday, you know, the song that she had out there that we've just got to be friends. Um, that's what this is all about. And uh, with shrinking budgets, natural disasters, asymmetric threats, a resurgent Russia, and assertive China, these are just some of those many challenges our nation is currently facing. And the only way we can successfully take on these daunting challenges is by building upon our global partnerships. So these partnerships are necessary in part because today's Air Force were stretched. You heard the chief talk about it just a little while ago. We're stretched more than ever before. Uh, for more than you know, 24 years, we've been in continuous comment, as, he's, as he quoted. And our aircraft fleet, it's the oldest it's ever been. And we continuously face unpredictable budgets, rising costs, and constrained resources. So delivering global vigilance, global power, global reach, it requires global partnerships. And it requires us to, as we are, these challenges are growing bigger, it's going to require us to do things a little bit smarter. So I propose to you that we need to look at the cooperation with our foreign partners and how we can best achieve that. And we can't wait into the middle of the next disaster or the next conflict to figure out how we can work together and improve our tactics, procedures, our equipment. The time to do that is now. We need to take lessons learned from current ongoing operations, contingency operations from current disaster response. Take those lessons learned and try and incorporate them. Find where did we see risks in those operations and how can we collectively improve together? So we've been engaged in the security cooperation business for a long time, but it's more important now than it's ever been. So I want to walk you through why it's important, you know, how we're engaging today, and what we can do to be better together in the future. So let me start with why. Our nation has a long history of building alliances with many of our deepest partnerships, dating back to World War I and World War II. Many airmen in this room have seen firsthand the depth of our relationship with these old allies like the UK, Australia, New Zealand. But even more impressive is the fact that some of our oldest and strongest alliances are with partners who were adversaries in previous conflicts. Take our strong relationship with the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force, whose Air Chief, General Saito, is here with us today, along with his counterparts from other Asia-Pacific nations. This relationship, it was fostered by a post-war dedication to bilateral security cooperation that continues on today. The U.S. national military strategy that was just signed out this June calls on us to strengthen our global network of allies and partners as one of its three main objectives. Security cooperation, it allows us to build a collective force and a deeper relationship of capabilities and air power by leveraging one another's resources. Through cooperation, we mitigate risks, we increase our access, we shorten response time, and affect the strategic calculus of potential adversaries. But more importantly, the strong partnerships enable us 
the United States and our partners to operate together seamlessly. So let me highlight now how we are engaging now to build these strong, meaningful partnerships. So during my time as Deputy Undersecretary, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and engage with airmen at many levels. I've met with everyone from MAGCOM leaders to our frontline airmen, civil servants, and our joint partners. And I've, I've found that our airmen out there, they are bracing, embracing the importance of building international partnerships, recognizing that security cooperation, it's more than just helping our partners buy aircraft and munitions. Now, it's true that for military sales represents an important part of the spectrum of security cooperation. Over 70 countries now share common mobility, fighter, or refueling f aircraft with the U.S. Air Force. And we see new opportunities approaching with air refueling and with remotely piloted aircraft and smart weapons. But I'd like to say that security cooperation is defined by what we call the three C's. It has to do with cooperation, capability, and capacity. It means that in addition to a proactive approach to foreign military sales, we continue to strengthen core functions, which include providing international professional military education, developing our best airmen out there as regional uh, strategy, regional affairs specialists, and looking at including our partners in our high-end exercises. Through these diverse pillars, the security cooperation enterprise spans a rainbow of programs and efforts involving every MAGCOM, including the functionals. So just a few examples that I want to give you of, of what the functionals are doing, because you'll hear more from our two regional commanders here, is the mobility support advisory squadrons. They're managed by the Air Mobility Command mentor, advise, and instruct partner air forces to help them build their air power capabilities and capacities. Also, the Air Education and Training Command, it, ho it hosts the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program at Shepard Air Force Base, which trains approximately 60 international student pilots annually. And then also, I want to bring in the Space Command. Air Force Space Command supports six nation wideband global SATCOM partnerships, that provide large bandwidth communications for military forces around the globe. So these examples give you just a glimpse of the broad reach of ongoing security cooperation efforts within our Air Force. And again, you'll hear more from General Gorence and General Robinson about the multitude of regional engagements that they have. The driving force behind our successful security cooperation, though, it's our people. Over 1,500 airmen and civilians throughout the Air Force Security Cooperation Enterprise work international partnerships and security cooperation issues. They serve as air attaches, regional affairs, and political affairs strategists, air advisors, instructors, and other critical roles across the globe. And as we continue to build and we strengthen international partnerships, we'll absolutely need more capable international airmen. Which brings me to the last part, and that's how. All airmen, whether you are a maintainer or a pilot, junior enlisted or commander, must embrace a commitment to security cooperation. We need everyone to be an international airman. I challenge you to include regional affairs and cultural studies as part of your continuing education. Apply the language-enabled airman program to learn a foreign language, and ask me after this how you can become a regional affairs uh, specialist in our Air Force. Arm yourself with the right skills and knowledge, and you'll enable stronger partnerships and a more stable future for the U.S. and our allies. For our industry partners here in the audience, continue your collaboration with us to ensure you are the best poised to help our allies and friends around the world obtain the right aircraft and equipment to meet the need, their needs as well as ours here in the U.S. And to our international friends in the audience, including these Pacific Air Chiefs, my friends from nine of our partner nations, I commend you for the work you've done and the challenges um, that you face and how we work so well together and finding ways that we continue through these lessons learned and operations that we can be stronger together. So what is it that we need? What do we need to do better? So it's great knowing that your Air Force must strengthen partnerships with other nations and Air Forces, but you may be wondering, what are we working towards? 
how do we know what capabilities and capacity our partners could develop and that will also help meet the needs and our shared interests? We put a lot of brain power towards answering these questions. After careful analysis and collaboration and stakeholders across our entire Air Force, we've highlighted capabilities we would like our partners to invest in to strengthen our collective ability to respond to challenges. From a broad perspective, we see a need to prioritize partner capability and capacity in three areas, and that's ISR being number one, mobility, and command and control. And I want to emphasize that this is a very broad perspective. We recognize that we can't take one-size-fits-all approach to helping our partners, each with their unique challenges, but priorities and strategy will help vector our efforts. So before I close, I must say that our partners, as a coalition, we certainly are more capable now than we were 10 years ago. Credit is given both to their hard work and the hard work of the Air Force Security Cooperation Enterprise. This was especially evident five months ago after the devastating earthquake that, earthquake that occurred in Nepal on April 25th. It is remarkable that over 10 nations deployed their mobility aircraft to the disaster zone, many employing equipment and training facilitated by security cooperation. The disaster response was just one example of how security cooperation has improved our collective capability while individual nations, including our own, are challenged for resources. So the only way we can be successful taking on these daunting challenges is by building our global partnerships. We're stronger with one voice, one vision, one common direction. So we're stronger together. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk to some slides just to kind of uh, um, hopefully inspire some questions and kind of let you know what, how we're set up and what our responsibilities are, and hopefully that will inspire some questions uh, from you. Um, I am the uh, uh, USAFE and F Africa commander. It kind of puts me in a unique position in the sense that we are the one component match com that actually uh, has responsibilities to be components to two combatant commanders. Uh, General Breedlove is the UCOM commander, uh, General Dave Rodriguez as the AFRICOM commander. I wanted to start with this slide. This is a nighttime shot of the lighting in the world. I am. Our, our AOR is comprised of 104 countries, and uh, as you can see by the, uh, the chart there, um, Europe is very well developed, infrastructure is good, uh, but we also have responsibilities in Africa, and you can see by the amount of lighting uh, that is in Africa that it's a completely different problem set with completely different challenges, except that fundamentally the same um, component uh, competencies that we, b we bring as an Air Force have to be employed uh, in both uh, Europe and in Africa. The bottom represents basically the four uh, problem sets that we've been dealing with among others. Of course, Russia, um, ISIS, Ebola, and the uh, EU flag is indicative of the rising crisis that is happening both in Africa and in Europe with respect to the uh, migrant issue that you see on, on television. And so what does that mean for us? Um, I wanted to show you the resources that we had to do it. This is a simple chart, but I wanted to share it with you before I moved on. In the uh, 1990s, uh, basically the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, we supported one COCOM. We had four separate staffs to do it. Uh, you can see we had 25 main operating bases, about 72,000 people permanently assigned in Europe. We had 34 uh, air, uh, squadrons of airplanes with about 800 airplanes, and basically the mission tempo was described by that list that you see there. Today, we fundamentally transformed and uh, we're supporting two combatant commanders uh, with one integrated staff inspired by some of the downsizing in staff 
uh, that we've been doing. Uh, rep, you know, we have uh, the USAFIAF Africa staff. Uh, Third Air Force has a minimal staff to allow uh, that commander to uh, execute all the discipline inside the command. We have a 17th EAF that represents all of the uh, rotational forces that work Africa. 16th Air Force is inactive um, with nobody in it. And then our forces, you can see there, fundamentally I describe it as since the end of the Cold War, we have taken a 75% reduction, except for personnel, uh, for the missions in uh, Europe and in Africa. And uh, the mission tempo you can see there, and the focus you can see there, but we can talk about that if you have any questions. But um, by the way, these numbers with, per with, with percentages does not include the reductions that are happening as a result of the European infrastructure consolidation effort uh, that recently uh, just got completed and that we're in the process of implementing. Next slide. So here's what we're doing uh, in all of those areas. For Africa Command, our focus is ISR, building partnership capacity, mobility, and a new normal mission that basically defines uh, requirements from the AFRICOM commanders with respect to the relationship with embassies. Uh, for U European Command, uh, we are executing the European Reassurance Initiative. Of course, we're doing building partnership capacity efforts. Uh, we're working indications and warnings that would support both uh, you know, pr primarily the emerging mission of theater ballistic missile defense. And then, of course, we're full contributors to Atlantic Resolve and the TSP theater security packages that uh, after uh, Putin invaded Crimea and, uh, and the Ukraine, uh, we were able to prioritize high enough to get first uh, a squadron of A-10s for our use for six months, a squadron of F-15s for our use for six months, and this, at the end of this month, we'll integrate another TSP of, um, of A-10s for six months. I also have responsibilities for uh, NATO, and uh, the arrow uh, in the upward direction describes um, our contribution uh, with that permanently assigned force in Europe with respect to uh, the air policing effort that we do. Uh, it's a NATO mission. The emerging uh, ballistic missile defense mission uh, uh, on the alliance side. And then, of course, the uh, VJTF is an acronym for the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, which is an adaptation uh, effort inside of the readiness action plan uh, that was put out by uh, the Whale Summit communique, and we're implementing that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then, of course, as a MATCHCOM, I also have OT&E responsibilities to Headquarters Air Force for those airmen that are permanently assigned uh, to the European theater. Africa does not have any permanently assigned force, so that is all done in a uh, rotational way. And uh, the European infrastructure consolidation effort is also uh, is what we support uh, for the headquarters Air Force. But, next slide. We also do many things for other commands, those four in particular, and you'll see the bubbles that pop up around those missions, uh, but throughout Europe, throughout Africa, uh, we basically, BOS is base operating support, AE is uh, uh, um, is uh, uh, AEAR is uh, aeromedical evacuation. Uh, C2 uh, components for all of uh, uh, Transcom in particular. In the lower left-hand corner, we do things for strategic uh, command, weapon storage, base operating support, uh, C2 elements. On the CENTCOM side, we are full participants with our permanently assigned forces to the AEF. Uh, of course, we do ISR and uh, um, uh, OIR and ISIS efforts, uh, particularly with respect to the stand-up of Inserlik uh, to support that effort. 
And then, of course, in the upper right-hand corner is uh, SOCOM and all of the things that we do uh, with them. You know what the acronyms are. PR is Personnel uh, Recovery. So, so that, that's what we do with the force that we have uh, in, that, in the theater. Here is a kind of a summary of the countries that we do mill-to-mill -mill engagements to help build partnership capacity uh, across the board, both inside of uh, uh, Europe and inside of uh, Africa. You add to that the um, AEF, that missions that we do in accordance with the big plan and the support uh, to support all of the uh, efforts worldwide. Of course, the green dots are exercises that we accomplish not only with permanent and rotational forces, but forces that come TDY, including the total force effort of the state partnership programs. And then finally, the, the theater security packages that uh, came, the A-10s, the F-15s, and once again, another group of A-10s. Uh, we pretty much put them on the road and took them all over Europe. We took some uh, innovative steps to do what I call micro deployments to send four airplanes here, two airplanes there to support JTAC training, which of course takes a little risk, uh, but we decided to do that and uh, uh, quite honestly it was a very, very good effort. So that's kind of what we've done over the last year to support uh, the aspirations of General Breedlove in his UCOM hat, uh, General Rodriguez in his AFRICOM hat, and then General Breedlove in his uh, sack your hat. And so I'm going to leave you with this thought. Um, we're forward, we're ready, we're ready now. That's kind of our addendum to the Air Force mission of fly, fight, and win in airspace and cyber. We're one step closer to many things that matter to our country and uh, uh, to our alliance. And I thought long and hard about how I would actually address the idea of how do we do this in a, in a time of austerity, and I don't come up with any solution uh, except to say we take a little bit of risk and we put the requirement and the op tempo squarely on the backs of our airmen to do more with less, and when we can't, we work with the uh, combatant commanders to either get more resources or relief from the asset. This is not rocket science stuff because we have to engage one partner or one ally at a time. And what we found is, and what we like to say, you can't surge relationships and you can't surge trust. This is just work that has to be done in a very steady, in a methodic way to make sure that if and when something happens that requires the bringing together of a coalition of the willing or the alliance or a combination of both, that we're interoperable and that we're able to accomplish the mission in a very swift way. And so I'll stop. I'll be hands happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. So over to you, Lori. Thanks. Thanks, Heidi and Gork. Um, I'm going to kind of pile on a couple of things that both uh, uh, my partners here uh, talked about uh, and then uh, stop. Uh, you know, think about what we've heard from the chief today. Think about what we've heard uh, from Hawk Carlisle earlier today about the fact that the op tempo hasn't uh, decreased. In fact, for the United States Air Force, it's increased. Think about the, the fact that everybody just wants to turn the uh, light switch on and expect us, them to get what they need instantly from our United United States Air Force, and we do it. Um, now think about uh, in Central Command, we hear every day what's happening in Central Command. We heard, had just a great rundown uh, from uh, UCOM and AFRICOM, and now talk about the fact that we're having dwindling resources uh, and dwindling ca uh, capacity and our forces, the oldest, as Heidi said, uh, and we're looking forward and how do we get what we need. Um, I sit back and I look at the theater that I have the responsibility for, uh, over 52% of the globe, uh, worried about North Korea, uh, worried about a rising China as they build capacity and capability uh, in, their, in their military. Uh, 
military, worried about China as they continue with their, uh, and over time have reclamated over um, 3,000 acres of land in the South China Sea and put down a 10,000 foot runway. And think about now, uh, as I watch Russia, you know, we hear uh, a lot about Russia in Europe, uh, but as Russia has um, begun uh, a lot of instability uh, in the Arctic and that long range aviation has now come down, circumvented Guam, circumvented uh, Japan, uh, has gotten uh, close to uh, California. And so, uh, like, uh, like General Gorentz, uh, how do I do that? How do I deal with all of those things in this uncertain environment? Uh, and then, uh, in the theater, we live on the ring of fire. Uh, and 80 percent of the world's disasters happen in the theater, and over 2.4 billion people have been affected in the last 10 years. Those are all things that require all of us to do things together. And if I look at the force structure that has increased uh, in, Japan, in uh, China, and I look at the force structure that the United States has had uh, in uh, the theater, that force structure for the United States has not changed dramatically over time. At the same time, uh, we've been operationalizing our headquarters. Uh, the combatant commander has been operationalizing his headquarters uh, to think about uh, how does he command and control the theater, uh, how, do, how does he as the joint force commander uh, work with his staff with now we are all components uh, in the Pacific. So as an air component commander, my responsibility uh, to Admiral Harris as the air component commander and the joint force air component commander for the theater, the responsibility to provide to him uh, good advice uh, and, and recommendations uh, as the air component to him on the, use, the best use of air. At the same time, uh, as, as Gork has mentioned, you know, the headquarters has reduced. We lost a numbered Air Force uh, and has gone uh, since 2012 uh, from to approximately 1,200 people to a little over 800 people. And as the, uh, the reason to have to do organize, train, and equip as a major command, uh, I'm responsible back to the chief to do that. On top of that lay the fiscal concerns and the fiscal uncertainty that we have in, the, in the, this current environment. Uh, are we going to have a short continuing resolution or are we going to have a long continuing resolution? And what does that do to our ability uh, to, to be present uh, in the theater and what does that do to our ability to remain good partners with our friends in the theater? Uh, when we had sequestration in 2013, uh, we had to cancel an exercise, and w during the cancellation of that exercise, one of the country's uh, air chiefs said, we need the United States to be good, steady partners, and we have to be good, steady partners, and we have to provide predictable engagements. So how do we, how do we work in this austere environment? We work in very easily in very small groups of uh, people to go out and engage our partner countries, to work with our partner countries. Heidi gave a great example. There are tons of examples throughout the Pacific theater, all the way to large scale exercises. We talked yesterday about Cope North and Red Flag Alaska. We do have the theater security packages that come in, the continuous bomber presence that we have, and uh, lots of exercises and engagements throughout. But as I look to the future, and I'm not sure what's going to happen, can I keep up the same level of engagement? And if the United States isn't engaging in these places, who will be? Who will be there? And, uh, and I don't come up with very good answers when I can think about that. So I, I worry about not just in today's austere, but what happens in the next year and what happens in the year after that. And how our, our being in the theater, in concert with our friends and our partners, has really helped with peace and stability in the region. Uh, and that, to me, is what's incredibly important. So I'll close quickly. I can't tell you how much it's been an honor for me to meet the air chiefs that uh, came to Hawaii first and have traveled with me here. Uh, and uh, they have been great partners. Uh, and they are great partners and friends and allies. Uh, and I know that without them, without us doing these things together, that stability in the region would be more at risk than it is today. Thank you. So for our two commanders in the AORs, as we look at a resurgent Russia, we look at some of the, what China is doing, and we're still in combat in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. We've heard about the Air Force getting smaller, less capacity. As the COCOMs arm wrestle on forces to do the things you're talking about, how do we best adjudicate where that goes? 
because there's a real capacity issue in my humble opinion. So having had a boss that talked to me a lot about that, um, you know, at the end of the day, the United States Air Force has what the United States Air Force has. And the joint staff through global force management has to be the adjudicator for that. And where the conversations are tough are between two combatant commanders that want the same amount of force and want all that force. So as we work through global force management issues, um, that happens down at the, at, as you know, at the joint staff level, all we can do is be responsive to, to that adjudication and realize that, uh, that those two COCOMs have to talk. That being said, the only other thing I would add is appetite suppressant from a, from a COCOM perspective. Uh, but we haven't seen that. In fact, as, as was said, uh, the demand for air is only going up. Yeah, and I have to admit that uh, if I was uh, one of the combatant commanders, uh, my appetite wouldn't be suppressed whatsoever. I mean, they have responsibilities for their mission. They need to describe the requirement. Whether or not they get filled is, is, uh, is another thing. But, you know, uh, to be perfectly honest, the way it works out is uh, permanently assigned forces become the buffer and, uh, and, and, and in the end, you tap in more to those permanently assigned forces. Uh, the only problem with that is, given the way that our AEF cycle works, oftentimes you're tapping into those permanently assigned forces to, while we're waiting to get a decision on prioritization, and it takes away uh, from their ability to regenerate and rebuild their readiness from their previous deployment. And so I'm very cognizant of that, and I'm very clear uh, with my concerns uh, on the ability to make sure that when a unit is back trying to regain full spectrum readiness, that we don't tap into them while we're waiting for prioritization. But um, I feel for the combatant commanders, because there's a lot of stuff, you know, that are going on, I know, in my theater everywhere. And uh, for me, just to let you know, uh, the NATO alliance is certainly looking to the east at threats. They're certainly looking to the south at threats. Now they're looking to the north at threats. You know, the only thing that's uncovered is from the west, unless you believe Ireland is a threat. So. Well, that was directed to the regional commanders, if I can take a shot at it, too. So. You know, if, if there's a conflict or uh, our assets are moved to the Pacific theater, these are the type of conversations that we're having with the European partners or all of our partners that if that were to happen, we're having that honest discussion say, how are you going to step up if we don't have the mobility assets or whatever it is that's been pulled to the Pacific? Okay, European partners, who is going to fill that gap if we have to move assets over? And let's talk about it today for the conflict or the disaster that's going to happen five years from now and get after it today. Well, that's a great segue, uh, Ms. Grant, to the next question, and that is how do we collectively prioritize partner capabilities across the COCOMs? Can the U.S. foresee better burden sharing with partners in areas like ISR and mobility? So, so this is one of the efforts that we've been doing now across uh, all the MAGCOMs, and as you heard me talk, not just the regional MAGCOMs, but the functional MAGCOMs, to what I call uh, synchronizing the security cooper cooperation enterprise. So it's been a big effort that we've been doing to look at what everybody brings as far as building partnerships and, and synchronizing uh, that effort. And I would like, my dream is to take it to the next step, having that conversation with each of our partners and allies out there is where are your strengths? Where can the U.S. back off on potentially building capabilities and partners uh, in certain regions or countries? Can you step up and fill that so we can concentrate in another uh, expertise area? Uh, I'd just like to add on to it. I mean, one of the benefits that we have uh, inside the alliance is, um, is we have standards that we have to adhere to in order to uh, remain interoperable. Um, 
success in the future, particularly with a smaller force in fiscally austere environments, is going to require interoperability. Most of the time, that interoperability involves the ability to move information machine to machine in a multi you know, multi-classification kind of environment. So again, this is one of these things that have to be worked uh, day to day inside the alliance. There's a structure to do that. But I think that all coalition partners, uh, when we talk about equipment compatibility, uh, work on the things that aren't so obvious, and that's the way databases are set up, the way that we are able to move information machine to machine to make the most of the equipment that we have, uh, particularly as we're getting smaller. So those kind of, that kind of attention to detail in the bilateral relationship is certainly important, and, and in coalitions of the willing will be important if you want to stand up and operate day one after you get together. So John Gorn, so uh, question is physical presence in Africa important, why, and will that physical presence grow, and how? Sorry, I missed that. Is, is physical presence required? Yeah. Is physical presence in Africa important, and why, and will that physical presence grow, and how? Uh, the answer is, is uh, uh, yes. You know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's important to recognize that uh, um, while many of the, of, the, of the countries in Africa are not, um, are not uh, high-end necessar you know, necessarily. Uh, many of them don't even have a lot in, in airplane. But the point of it is there, the, the good news about that environment is uh, to be an Air Force, there's a lot of tasks that have to be accomplished that are outside uh, the flying mission. You know, the ability to do humanitarian operations, medical stuff, logistics. What I have found is a little bit of attention uh, to our smaller partners reap large uh, benefits, particularly when we're doing it face to face and we show a commitment. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we, uh, and, it, and then it also helps to not only have the bilateral relationship with the country that we're talking about, but to try and develop some regional kind of relationships to see where those countries may have common concerns and where we can do things together. That's difficult in Africa given the history of Africa, but we continue to try to do it and a little bit of attention uh, in a face-to-face -face way reaps large benefits across the board. Thank you. General Robinson, most of your discussion of your presentation uh, centered around peacetime activities. But how much risk are we accepting in terms of our ability to conduct full spectrum operations as compared to, say, a couple decades ago? And what options do you have to mitigate that risk? So as we have looked through what's happening in the theater, you know, we're, we're used to um, having uh, a lot of time and a lot of leadway to understand uh, what might happen. Uh, that's changed a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, we talk about uh, should we need to, we need to be ready to fight right now. And so what that has done is uh, changed the readiness on uh, or may ensured the readiness capability on the Korean Peninsula uh, is there and ensure the forces uh, both uh, uh, in Japan and Alaska are ready right now. Uh, that, gets, that gets some uh, uh, detraction sometimes when uh, global force management moves F-16s from Misawa over to CENTCOM, rightfully so, to support that. But as uh, General Gorntz mentioned, when they come back, it takes them time uh, to get back up. So this is a real great place where we talk about uh, our interoperability and our ability uh, to work with, together with our uh, allies. And uh, how do we share not just with our allies, but how do we share, in my, from my perspective, from naval air, uh, and if necessary, if I can, uh, Marine Corps error. So is there risk? Absolutely there's risk. Uh, and we try and mitigate that risk through understanding what capability and capacity uh, we'll be, we will have and what capability and capacity is ready to do uh, fight right now. Uh, and then another uh, uh, opportunity to mitigate that risk is what type of force structure when or if I can take uh, and move from Alaska uh, down to uh, Japan and Okinawa 
if I'm allowed to do that. Uh, so, and then the next part is exercising with our friends and allies uh, so that we know what each of us are capable of, so we know that uh, should something happen, we know what we've got to do and what we can do. Thank you. If um, I can add on that, the one thing that I think both Lori and I are uh, uh, alarmed at, um, the people that are causing us challenges in both of our theaters are not sitting around and, and, and waiting for things to do. You know, in my area, particularly in Europe, um, uh, the Russians in particular uh, have closed uh, our, our capability advantage in the air um, fast, just like the chief said this afternoon. I think that's exactly the right way to describe it. On top of that, the level of anti-access area denial um, uh, areas in, in Europe in particular uh, have grown and that's making it even harder. And so I think what we have, at least in my neck of the woods, is uh, somebody who, is, a, who is, a, uh, is acting in a very aggressive way, who's increased their capacity and capability. Uh, and then on top of that, with the dwindling resources that we have with respect to modernization and the things that we would like to do, it's going like this. And I think we just need to recognize that and get ready for it. We'll certainly accommodate it. We have to train for it. But, but that doesn't uh, negate the fact that this capability difference that we've enjoyed for so long is closing. It is what it is, and there's only certain ways to fix that. It takes time. Well, unfortunately, we're about running out of time. Ms. Grant, do you have any closing remarks? Maybe 30 seconds or less? <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to our panel members today for uh, your presentations and for uh, discussing with us uh, the challenges that you have. We very much appreciate you being with us today. This is the last session of day two for our conference. We hope to see you back here tomorrow, beginning at 9 o'clock. Have a great, great evening. Thank you.